Hey, thank you for listening to Episco Auburn. This is the fourth episode of this podcast because we're always trying new things. My name is Gail Goldsmith. I'm a priest at Holy Trinity Episcopal Church and Episcopal Student Ministries. The purpose of this podcast is to follow in the tradition of the Apostle Paul's pastoral letters to specific communities. Because this is a pandemic adaptation and I miss you, we're gathering on Zoom on Wednesdays at 2.30. Look in GroupMe for the link. But also, if you're curious about what we do and how we gather, I hope this is useful to you too. We're reading through the Acts of the Apostles about what God's people did in uncertain and changing times, how the fragile, freaked out, fallible people of God prayed, followed the Holy Spirit, and took the gospel into new places. I don't know, sound irrelevant. Last time we talked about Ananias and Sapphira, the rejection of the idea of couples' sovereignty, the seculosity of marriage, and looked at a prayer book understanding of marriage as one way to continue in discipleship and community accountability. Also, the student admitted he had been reading this as Ananias and Sephora, and I'm still cracking up. If you aren't vain like me, just kidding, we've rebranded it as being into self-care. Sephora is a makeup and skincare store. And much like Sapphira, they recently went back on a promise about wages for part-time employees. So, contemporary relevance, unexpected places. We're skipping ahead to focus on Stephen, but read through the rest of Chapter 5, particularly the Gamaliel stuff. It's really great. The thing to remember, the Jesus movement does not yet understand itself as distinct from Judaism yet. Everyone we're talking about is a Jew. Some identify, are identified as apostles, disciples, or converts. Others by ethnicity or geography. Hebrew, Gentile. We'll hear Hellenist in a minute. All right, picking up at chapter 6. The first few verses set up a new situation. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Taking material action to support widows is a strong theme in the law of Moses and in Jesus' ministry. And the church in Acts twice talks about how mutual aid and generosity is a large part of who they are. So this is a very strange distinction between word and service. It kind of reminds me of the Martha and Mary thing a little bit. That was, is it better to sit at Jesus' feet, to listen, or to make hospitality happen? But we hear both in Acts. We hear nobody was left hungry. Preaching also gets the most verses. Jesus did both word and service, following the commandments to love God and neighbor. But we are all imperfect followers. Something we might talk about when we gather on Zoom is how we hear this distinction and how prayer and study have led you to service. I'd love to hear more about that. Next, let's look at verse 8. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Good stuff. Things take a turn. We hear that those who belong to the synagogue of the free men instigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And here's why the geography there is significant. Uh, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia. Willie Jennings offers this context. Stephen's words and ministry are opposed not by evil God-haters, but by faithful Jews who understood slavery, the ancient and contemporary horror that reduces humans to utility bodies and nameless tools. He continues, They either knew slavery personally or in parental memory, and their commitment to Israel and its way of life was woven into their legacy of hard-won freedom. These men were faithful to God and faithful to their covenantal identity, formed in foreign places. 
but they saw their fears collapse onto their faith and they descended into worldly captivity by taking on themselves the same political operation that brought on the torture and assassination of Jesus. Once again, he continues, we see the contradiction of the faithful acting against their faith, but now that contradiction unfolds inside the painful failure to see the very help Israel needs to maintain its identity and deepen its faithfulness, shining out in the face of Stephen. So he's put on trial, and Stephen does not defend himself. There's, there's no winning friends and influencing people here. He indicts the Jewish people for rejecting and persecuting the prophets. He um, calls them betrayers and murderers. Uh, the people are enraged. They drag Stephen out of the city and stone him to death. Looking at verse 13. They set up false witnesses who said, This man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed to us. All of this parallels charges put against Jesus and his ministry. It's possible that the opponents of Stephen are simply putting a negative spin on things he did say, since the charges against Jesus had a basis in reality. But this is important to know, too. Claiming Stephen was blaspheming has Mosaic law consequences. Leviticus 24, verse 16 says, Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. The entire assembly must stone them. There's that much reverence. There's that much fear. Okay, so read through Stephen's speech in chapter 7, and then come back to this. I've got a few things to highlight for you. Stephen would summarize what he says as talking about how God uses unlikely people. Which? Yes. And God is bigger than all the places we look for God. And then at the end, he gets very you people about it. The Jewish Annotated New Testament by Mark V. Brettler and Amy Jill Levine highlights this. The critical references to building the temple elevate the value of God's universal presence over a possible implicit belief that God is particularly present in the temple. But wait, the people stoning Stephen would have agreed with him that the temple doesn't contain God. Here's a part of Solomon's prayer of dedication in the temple found in uh, 1 Kings 8. Lord, the God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You, you who keep the covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built? So perhaps this is more about the theme of disobedience. I'm thinking if you're listening to Stephen say all this, it must be hard to hear. He's been accused of blasphemy, and he's saying here, worship is incomplete, and you misunderstand God. In his theological commentary on Acts, Willie Jennings writes this, We read this text poorly if we read it like a theological jigsaw puzzle, or historical recitation, or even Luke proving a point. It may be all of those things. But first of all, it's a performance. It's a storyteller at work, inviting his listeners to move from death to life. Another thing to note, Stephen's preaching against diaspora fears with his concept of the resident alien. The idea that Christianity does not make you a good citizen. If this is something you're interested in, look up Stanley Hauerwas. Here's a really brief summary of his project. The church does not exist to provide an ethos for democracy or any other form of social organization, but stands as a political alternative to every nation, witnessing to the kind of social life possible for those who have been formed by the story of Christ. Stanley Hauerwas, Resident Aliens. By contrast, look up chapter 9 of Nehemiah. God's exiled people gather to commit themselves to covenant with God. They begin with praise and confession, and then their retelling of the salvation story follows similar themes to Stephen. 
killing of the prophets, the law, the covenant with Abraham, deliverance from slavery, worshiping idols, and following the wrong leaders. Chapter 9 of Nehemiah, verse 5. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. And here's that theme of disobedience again. Verse 28. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. You abandoned them to the hand of their enemies, so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven, and in your compassion you delivered them time after time. Stubbornly they turned their backs on you, became stiff-necked and refused to listen. For years you were patient with them. By your spirit you warned them through your prophets. But they paid no attention, so you gave them in the hands of the neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Verse 38. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing. And our leaders, our Levites, and our priests are affixing their seals to it. What's different about this than Stephen's speech? They're saying us. The antecedent of they in this excerpt is our ancestors. They're recognizing their role, their complicity in this. The same, um, same sin that ensnares us all. We cannot work for our own good. Through it all, there's strong preaching about God's grace and our brokenness. So yeah, Nehemiah chapter 9. Back to Stephen. Whatever else Stephen says, he also says this. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. He follows Jesus to the last, praying for those who hurt him. And Saul approves of their killing him. Notorious enters the narrative right here in chapter 8, verse 1. Next, devout men bury Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. If you'd like to read more about the development of martyrdom, I really recommend The Myth of Persecution by Candida Moss. Stephen's a martyr, but he was first a friend and brother in Christ. Looking at chapter 8, verse 2. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. Men lament loudly. It's not gendered or weak. It's true to our sense of loss. It stands in stark contrast to our hope. Jesus broke the hold of death on us, but we're still going to miss our loved ones until the resurrection. All right, let's stop there. Read Nehemiah 9. Have a good day. And let's talk about this when we gather on Zoom. Or you can send me an email at gail at holytrinitychurch.info. Thank you.